So a few things that uh, on our agenda for today. We're going to finish up talking about a review of caches, and then we're going to start talking about uh, in-order superscalars. So this is something new. Uh, and I wanted to uh, say this now, but we'll I'll reiterate when I come to it. Um, this other book, the Shen Laposte book, um, is probably use more, is much more useful for the superscalar portion of our class than the Patterson, or Hennessy and Patterson book. And I recommend either acquiring it or uh, borrowing a friend's or the library has a copy of that book and at least reading the sort of two to three chapters in there would be useful. Um, but that's not until the second half of today's lecture. The first half we have to go finish up caches. So going back to our review, let's, let's talk about what caches could, can look like on the inside. And a couple, couple different things about how to classify caches. So we've already talked about why caches are good. So a little bit of a review here. <clears throat> you have big slow things over here, big slow memories. And you have the processor. And you can, you, know, you can think about how to build small fast memories. And if we can put a small fast memory close and have a high probability that uh, you know, things are actually located in this small fast memory, then we don't have to go out to the big slow memory as often. We can save power and, perform and, and, and uh, have better performance, et cetera. OK, so how do we, how do we classify caches? And what, what are uh, going reviewing what, what a cache uh, sort of looks like on the inside? So processor, cache, main memory. Addresses flow that way. Data can go either direction, because you can either do a store, which will put data out from left to right, or you can read back data or do a load, uh, which will have data going back the other way. So let's, let's look at our sort of a, uh, mythical view here of what a cache looks like, or our, our view of what a cache looks like on the inside. So um, caches contain copies of what is being stored in the main memory. And if you look at inside of it here, you know, this, let's say, first line is at uh, trying to store address 100. So here we have address 100, and it has some data in there. And typically, we introduce this notion of a line in a cache because we want to reduce the tracking information uh, for a particular cache line, or sometimes called a block in the cache. If we, it is possible to build something which you know, tracks data on, let's say, a bit or a byte basis. But then your tracking information is probably larger than the amount of data you're actually trying to store. So that's not, not really a great idea there. Um, in the cache here, if you uh, look inside of it, what we store is we store an address tag. So it's not the full address. It could be the full address, but then you're probably storing extra, extra bits. You only need to store enough of the address to be able to differentiate uh, different things that can be stored at the same location. So in a fully associative cache, where you can put any data in any location, you would have to store, for instance, the whole address in the tag. But if you, let's say, have a direct mapped cache where each address can only go to one location, you're going to have to store a subset of the bits. Um, yes, and I wanted to sort of point out here, you know, sometimes people call the whole thing here a line. A line typically includes the tag information and uh, possibly valid bits. And the block is the actual data that you're storing. <clears throat> OK, so this is a really review here of how the algorithm or what the, the cache actually looks like. But let's, let's step through it briefly. So proce processor issues a load. So we're going to look at a load case here. We take the address and we compare the subset of the bits that can be, could be different for different things that uh, store into a single location in the cache. And we check it against the tag. Um, one thing not shown here is we also need to check to make sure it is valid, because it's possible you could have an invalid cache line. So typically there's a one bit which says whether the cache line is valid or not valid. You have to check to make sure it's valid. And if so, you get a cache hit and you just return the data. If not, you uh, go out to your main memory. Ooh, this is a tricky one here. You have to go find some place to go put that data. Because uh, this new data comes in, and if you want to store it in your cache now, there's probably something in that cache at the same location that you have to sort of bump out. And we're going to talk briefly about replacement policies. And later in the advanced caches lecture, we'll talk more about that and other cache uh, policies, much more advanced replacement policies. But you kick something out, and you fill it in, and then you finally return the data. You could also think about trying to do sort of this step and this step in parallel, 
um, effectively. And a lot of cache systems, and more advanced cache systems, will actually return the data before they sort of finish the eviction um, for, to, to reduce the latency of the load. OK, so let's, let's do some classification. Uh, so uh, some tautology here of what a cache looks like. So what, what can we talk about? Well, we can talk about block placement. So this is locations that a particular block or a particular, particular address can be found in the cache. Block identification, which is the uh, structure of how to actually go find something in a cache if I give an address. So this is kind of the inverse of the, the placement question. <clears throat> block replacement, which is figuring out what should be replaced on a miss. And then finally, um, what happens on a write? So these are all sort of read questions. Well, block replacement is not really a read question here, but uh, the right strategy is, is, a, is, a, is a good question here of what happens uh, when a uh, write occurs. Do we update all the caches, only the main memory? Do we evict just out of the cache? And all these are possible uh, uh, strategies to choose. OK, so let's look at a uh, block placement figure here and look at a couple different types of caches. So up here, we have a 31 or excuse me, 32 word memory. So let's say this is the, all of the memory in the uh, machine. And depending on how you want to look at this, maybe the, each block, let's say, is one byte, or it could be some number of bytes. So to give an example, a typical um, something like your Core 2 Duo, um, I believe, has a 64 byte cache line or cache block size. Some people have tried to sort of push that up. And, and there's reasons to sort of make it larger or smaller. But we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. <clears throat> so let's take uh, this highlighted location here, uh, block number 12. And let's see where it can fit into different types of caches. So we have three different types of caches here. Let's, let's start on the right side here. So on the right side, we have what's called direct mapped cache. So in a direct mapped cache, <clears throat> It is literally an array, and each block can only fit one place into the cache. And the indexing function that you use is you take the block number mod the size of the cache. So in this case, we are, have block number 12, or byte number 12 here. We take 12 mod 8, it says block 4. So this is the only place to go look for the data. OK, that's, that's nice, and, nice and simple. May not be the best performance. It's easy to build. Um, it's all index based. OK, then sort of one step up from there, um, we can start to look at things like set associativity. So what set associative means is instead of having only one location, one unique location that a uh, block can be placed, you allow it to be in some number of locations. So in this, there's, uh, this drawing here is a two-way set associative cache. So each block can either fit in one of two places. <clears throat> you, know, you can actually have you know, machines which have much uh, more associativity uh, or higher associativity. So an example of this uh, is the um, modern Core i7 processors. Their sort of L1 caches are eight-way set associative. And farther out, they're even higher associative. Uh, probably, I think they have a 16-way set associative cache out in their uh, L3 or L, uh, uh, farther out caches. <clears throat> so let's, let's look uh, through a basic example here. Um, if we want 12 mod 4, so how do we do this? Well, there's only four buckets, if you will. And inside that bucket, it can fit into either of the two sort of sub-slots in the bucket. Or they're called ways. So if we take 12 mod 4, that means uh, 12 mod 4 is 0, so it has to fall into this, uh, this bucket here. And it can be in either one of those two ways, and it can't be in both. That's an important, uh, important point there. Finally, there are types of caches which we'll call fully associative caches. So what this means is the <clears throat> associativity, or the number of ways, is equal to the number of elements in the cache. So here, there is a. Uh, there are eight elements or eight block locations in this cache, and it's fully associative, which means that there are eight uh, different uh, sets, if you will. So it can fit in any of these locations. So this same 
address here or block number 12 can fit anywhere in this cache. Okay, so now the next question is how do we actually find the block in the cache? <clears throat> so <clears throat> when you're going to, let's say, uh, take an address and you want to go figure out where it goes in the cache, let's, let's take a look at the example of a uh, direct mapped cache first. And here, here's sort of our information. We have, we have the, the data block, and then we have um, some tag information, and we have a valid bit. So if we look at the address that we're sticking in here, so let's say this is like a 32-bit address, um, some portion of that address is just going to figure out where in the data block the load or store is going to. So if you have, let's say, a 64-byte uh, cache line or 64 byte blocks, uh, data block, you're going to basically index into some subword in there based off the offset bits. Then um, we start to look at the block address. So the next, uh, uh, the, this is the traditional way to do this, that is that you use these sort of middle order bits as the index. There are more complicated cache systems which move this around or do much more complicated hashing functions. But the basic hash function here is we're going to take the index. So in this cache here, let's say that has three, or excuse me, four entries in the cache, how many, how many bits are in this index? Two, yes, okay, so two to the two is four. So there's, this index is into here and chooses one of these four locations. And then finally, um, this tag information here is used to compare against the tag that we store, and that will say whether this address is actually in the cache right now, or if we have to go out to main memory. So let's, let's work a brief example here. We have 32-bit addresses. We have a four-way, or excuse me, a four-set uh, cache, direct mapped cache. How many, how many bits? Uh, uh, and we have, okay, so we have 64 bytes in our block size. How many bits are in the offset? Let's start with that. Um, the offset's going to have to index a byte within the block here. So if we have byte addressable memory, and there's 64 different entries, uh, log base 2 of 64 is 6. Okay, so we have 6 bits worth of offset. Okay, what do we say about the index here? We said that there's already 2 bits. Okay, so that's 8 bits. So how many bits of tag do we have? So the tag information is 24 bits. And as you can see, as you make the data block larger, or the data block size large, larger, or the cache line size larger, you need fewer tag bits. Because it sort of eats away this way, and the index gets shifted up. <clears throat> so that's, that, could be, that could be a good thing. Um, finally, there's this, this V column here. Um, this is what I was alluding to before. It's really important. You need a uh, valid bit. Uh, to see whether the line is valid. It's very possible you could have old data or the cache is not initialized, at which point these, these V bits would all be zero or, or, or not valid. Okay, so a little bit more uh, advanced example here. We have uh, a two-way set associative cache still with four lines. And we want to go find our data. Hmm. So how do, we, how do we go about doing that? What's interesting here is when we did this, we only had to check one tag location. But for a cache like this, the index is going to tell us uh, which of the two sets it's in, but it can either be in either of the two ways of, of these sets. So we actually need to do a tag check against this tag and that tag and check the two valid bits. Um, and many caches can do this in parallel. Um, but that's how you can figure out, and it's possible it's in neither of those two, and we have to just take a cache miss. Okay, so let's, let's talk about um, when you need to go take things out of the cache. So let's talk about block replacements. So we need to figure out what to go uh, kick out of the cache. When you take a cache miss, you can go bring, bring some new data in. Um, so an important point here is in a direct map cache, this question makes no sense because in a direct map cache, it can only go to one location. 
in set associative or fully associative caches, we need to make a decision. And uh, hopefully we only need to make this decision when a set becomes full. Because otherwise we'll just choose the empty location in that set. So if we have a two-way set associative cache and one of the uh, ways is full of data and the other one is just empty, the valid bit is empty, we probably shouldn't even be looking at sort of different choices on how to replace things because there's an open spot to go put the data. We should just go put the data there. Okay, so what are, what are some good block replacement policies or good cache replacement policies? First one is random. You can just choose randomly out of a hat. Actually, it doesn't work so bad. It's, 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 you know, it's easy to implement. You just like have some random uh, linear feedback shift register or just something that sort of chooses a random number um, and, and you replace it. Not so, not so bad. We'll, we'll, now, now we start thinking about, we'll, uh, put our thinking caps on, and we can start thinking about some uh, better, better ways to go do this. Um, we can think about least recently used. Hmm. So the idea behind this strategy is that you are trying to preserve temporal locality. So if you've used some data recently, there's a heuristic here that it's likely to be used again in a not too distant time axis. So if you go back to that sort of time versus address plot that we had, in the time axis we think that, you know, temporal locality is something that happens relatively often. So one, one really good strategy is to try to look at um, the least recently used as the block to uh, get rid of. So if something has not been used recently, we kick that out of the cache. Now, some problems with this is this gets really hard to do. Uh, well, there's two problems. One, to implement appropriate least recently used, every single load or store that happens to the cache needs to update the information. Well, that's not great for power, but it's also not great because you basically need to have sort of very fine-grained tracking information on each uh, cache line on every single cycle that does a load or a store. So, you know, you need, you need some cache state that needs to be updated relatively often. Uh, plenty of people do that, though. There's, uh, uh, you know, if you have a least recently used uh, piece of information, we have an extra bit on each uh, cache line. You can think about just sort of flipping that back and forth and having one bit for that information. And every single load and store actually sets that bit. And lots of processors do that. So what, what starts to get hard here is when you try to go above uh, two-way caches. So two-way you have sort of one bit that can decide where, which is the most least recently used. If you start to have, let's say, an eight-way set associative cache and you want to do true least recently used, you have to somehow keep uh, like time stamps for each different uh, way. You have to say, oh, well, this one was just recently accessed and you know, you, know, you can time stamp it. You could try to sort of reorganize a list of, of numbers in order. And these, these, these things start to get uh, harder to do in hardware. And especially, you know, sort of on the critical path uh, of your processor. So a lot of times what people do is they have pseudo least recently used for higher associative caches where you'll try to sort of keep maybe accurate information in the last two uh, most recently used lines and the other ones you uh, do random or something like that. Or uh, there's some more complex uh, things which we'll talk later in the class about. Um, another one. Uh, First in, first out. So whatever gets brought into the cache first, sits in the cache for some period of time, and then gets uh, kicked out in the future. So you're sort of guaranteed that some piece of data that you bring in will sit in your cache for some period of time. And this is a lot easier to implement in uh, highly associative caches. But it's strictly not implementing least recently used because if you sort of bring in a cache line, let's say you have a four-way set associative cache, four axes later, it's at sort of the top of the list to get kicked out. But what's nice about this is you're guaranteed that it'll sit in your cache for some period of time and won't just get sort of randomly kicked out, which like random has problems with. Um, finally here, uh, another, another uh, acronym here, not most recently used. Well, let's think about that one for a second. So we're gonna kick out something that is not the most recently used block. So we can sort of keep track, let's say, of the uh, we have uh, uh, some index into our cache. If we have a, a four-way cache, we can think of having sort of two bits that says, well, this line was the most recently used, 
and the rest of them is sort of random. And we know we're not going to be kicking out the most recently used cache line. So write strategies. Um, you're going to do a store. You got to know where you put the data. Important, important, important thing here. Um, caches have lots of different uh, allocation policies and uh, policies about whether you sort of keep the data or throw out the data in the different levels of the cache hierarchy when a store happens or a write happens. So let's, let's take a look at a couple, couple different choices here. So let's say you are doing a store and you have a cache hit. So it hits in your, your cache. Should you go put that in main memory also? Um, if, you, if you do a uh, store, and you put every single store into your cache and into main memory, if it's already in your cache, then as you point out, it uses bandwidth out to the main memory. So that, that can be a downside. There are some positives to this, though. When you go to evict the line, you don't have to write anything back to main memory. So you sort of are pre-putting data into main memory. So that's, that's a positive. Um, you could also think about uh, if you have a multi-level cache hierarchy, some levels of the hierarchy may, be, may, may make sense to actually put it in sort of the next level out if you have enough bandwidth. So um, th this is actually a trade-off. As I said, computer architecture is all about trade-offs. Neither of these is actually correct. So the one is called write-through. So write-through means you put it in your cache if you get a cache hit and you put it in main memory. Write-back cache means you just put it in your local cache. And when that block gets evicted, if it has dirty data, you have to go put it back in the main memory. <clears throat> so uh, so that's, that's kind of the uh, uh, downsides and upsides there. One, one thing you do need to do if you have write back, as we say here, is that you need to keep track of if the data is dirty or not. Um, so if you go look at more complicated cache coherence protocols, sometimes you'll actually favor things like write through because write back gets really complicated when you have data that has to be uh, invalidated and, and sent out to other places. But if you knew the data was clean, i.e. it has no dirty data, you never have to do a write back when an invalidation comes in for a multi-processor scenario. So it's a tough, tough trade-off there. But as generally, sort of write back is considered to be more advanced and saves bandwidth. But there are uh, trade-offs there of why you might want to do the one or the other, because write through is definitely simpler to design. <clears throat> OK, so that's our. Uh, and, and, oh, I did want to point out that, you know, you may not actually go all the way out to the main memory. So um, plenty of architectures have small L1 caches, for instance where you don't necessarily want to deal with invalidations coming in and complicated things happening. Where you might do write through from your L1 to your L2, but then you want to save, let's say, off-chip bandwidth here, so you write back out of your uh, L2 to the DRAM. So that's, that is a pretty common sort of thing to do. Uh, and, and as I was saying, the real motivation for this is if you have a multiprocessor system <clears throat> and you have, let's say, invalidation requests. So let's say another processor wants that same cache line and the data is dirty here but not, into the D, not in the DRAM. You would actually have to sort of reach down into the L1 cache if you have write back out of the L1 cache. And that gets pretty complicated. The, and Especially it gets complicated if your L1 cache is very tightly integrated into your CPU because it's on your pipeline. Like it's in your main pipeline and you have to sort of bubble the pipe somehow or have a structural hazard for any uh, invalidation that comes into that L1 cache. So typically a lot of times people try not to have, uh, or they, they, people will consider write through caches at least from the L1 to the L2. But you definitely will save bandwidth uh, for a L2 sort of out to DRAM cache if you don't do write through every time. Okay, let's take a look at 
<clears throat> what happens on a cache miss? So on a cache miss, um, we're doing a store or a write to memory. Do we need to put it in our cache at all? Well, choices. Maybe yes, maybe no. There's no guarantee you don't have to put it in your cache. Um, a lot of times, and, and this is, comes down to heuristics here, a lot of times you'll actually do a store and you may just not read that again. So some architectures actually have uh, store instructions with locality hints or, or temporal locality hints saying, I'm doing this store or doing this write right now and I'm planning not to read it again for a very long period of time. Don't put it in my cache. Also, some things just decide not to do write allocate because, uh, uh, or so no, no I'll, I'll define these two things here. No write allocate means you're doing a store or a write to your cache and you're not going to pull the data into your cache um, to do the, the merging there locally, if you will. And you're not going to actually store any data into your cache because you, you don't have to. You're just uh, keeping a local copy of it. You don't actually have to, you're not forced to keep a local copy. You can always send it out to your canonical main memory. Write allocate says go fetch the data from memory, merge it in the cache because usually the block line Block size is longer than the amount of data you're writing, so merge it, <clears throat> and then uh, probably either put it out to main memory if you're right through, or just keep it in the cache. So you you if you're if you're right back. So you can think about uh, having these two policies, and and they they both they both have places. Um, some sometimes people will, uh, you know, typically people will try to do write allocate unless you have some locality information because data, let's say it's at the top of your stack in your processor or in your, in your uh, sort of software stack, you're going to basically be writing and reading from that relatively often, so it makes sense to try to allocate that. The other thing I did want to point out is there is a heuristic sort of going on with this no write allocate that if you read that block then, it will get into your cache. So maybe the first store that you do to the address won't uh, allocate, but the next load you do will allocate. So you're not going to miss that much by doing no write allocate. It's not like you've lost everything for forever. It's just that that first write, oh, well, I had to go out to the main memory system. But the next load that I do from, let's say, my stack or some local variable will pull that line in anyway. Okay, so some common combinations here. Uh, write back with write allocate. So this is sort of the uh, full-blown solution that a lot of people do. This is kind of like the base high performance one. Um, write through and no write allocate is uh, kind of possible. This is like the cheap one to build. Um, you don't need any logic here to deal with no write allocate, but all possible mixes are, are, are valid. 